Welcome to Lessons in History. The yellow today is, how did individuals shape Elizabethan England? During Elizabeth's reign, there were individuals that helped and those that hindered her. The point of today's video is to draw attention to all of these individuals. Just like I have said in my other videos, it is important to know the impact of an individual rather than the specific date an action took place. As Elizabeth ruled for 44 years, many of these individuals are involved in multiple events. That is why in this video I have tried to summarise the actions of an individual rather than going into detailed accounts of everything that they did. So for example, if you would like a detailed account of the Catholic plots or other topics, feel free to check out those specific videos on my channel. Timestamps for each individual covered in this video are in the comment section below. Make sure to hit subscribe and let's get started. I suppose it would be fair to say that Elizabeth certainly had some daddy issues. She deeply admired her father, despite being sent away from the royal court at a young age to be raised. She wrote to him frequently, perhaps seeking his affection. But the actions of Henry VIII certainly influenced Elizabeth's life before she was even born. Henry VIII, most famous for his six marriages and the second monarch of the Tudor dynasty, broke England from the Roman Catholic Church in the 1530s when he sought to divorce from Catherine of Aragon. He had three surviving children, the future Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I. Despite this, Elizabeth certainly loved her father, and it was one of the main reasons as to why she continued his work in developing the Church of England, following in his footsteps of change. Spanish Catherine originally married Henry VIII's brother, Arthur, but after his death and a time gap of seven years, married Henry in 1509. Hailing from Spain, Catherine was a strict Catholic. Unfortunately, the marriage failed to produce a surviving male heir. A tragic series of miscarriages, stillbirth and infant deaths had left just one heir to the throne, a daughter called Mary. At a time when the Tudor dynasty was still relatively new and civil war still within living memory, Henry thought the situation a disaster and convinced himself that the marriage to Catherine was invalid and that God had punished the couple for their sin by denying them any surviving son. The marriage to Henry ended in annulment after Henry broke from the Catholic Church in the 1530s. Do not underestimate or ignore Catherine's Spanish and Catholic background. This certainly would have an immense impact on her daughter Mary I and the relationships between England and Spain during the years of Elizabeth's reign. Second wife of Henry VIII and Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn was a lady-in-waiting in the court of Catherine of Aragon and spent much of her youth in France. She was a well-educated and had Protestant sympathies. She began her liaison with Henry VIII in the mid-1520s but refused to become Henry's mistress, instead demanding to be his wife. They had one daughter together, Elizabeth. Miscarriages in 1534 and 1536 may have led Henry, always spiritually superstitious, to question whether he had made the right choice to marry Anne. Accusations of adultery, and even plotting against the king's life, were levelled against the queen, her brother and a small group at court. A sham trial, filled with her enemies, found her guilty, and she found herself a prisoner at the Tower of London. Henry showed small mercy by granting her request to die by sword rather than axe. She was executed on Tower Green on May 19th, 1536. She had been married to Henry for just three years. Henry went on to marry Jane Seymour 11 days after Anne's execution. Mary Tudor, also known as Bloody Mary for her persecution of non-Catholics, was Elizabeth's older half-sister and ruled England from 1553 to her death in 1558. A staunch Catholic, she tried to undo many of the changes brought about by her father and restored the authority of the Pope in England. During her reign, prices rose with massive inflation, two failed harvests and epidemics of disease that blighted the reign. She married the future Philip II of Spain but failed to produce an heir. Mary had repeatedly refused to proclaim Elizabeth her heir until just a few days before her own death. The death occurred in 1558, leaving her half-sister Elizabeth I to inherit the throne. Elizabeth's younger half-brother, he briefly ruled England from 1547 to 1553. He was the son of Henry VIII and his third wife Jane Seymour. He was a strict Protestant, 
who introduced an English prayer book. He destroyed images in churches. Poverty grew during his reign as a result of the huge inflation. There was also the problem of serious rebellions in 1549 because of his changes to the church. He died of tuberculosis in 1553. He is of negligible importance in this course. The King of Spain from 1556 to 1598, the defender of Catholicism, and probably the most powerful man in the world at the time, had trouble suppressing Protestantism in the Netherlands. The English navy destroyed his supposedly invincible Spanish armada in 1588. He had, however, originally proposed to Elizabeth early on in her reign, but Elizabeth declined. Tensions grew between the Spanish king and Elizabeth as a result of the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, English privateers such as Sir Francis Drake and John Hawkins attacking Spanish ships, and, importantly, Elizabeth's support for the Protestant rebels in the Netherlands, as at this time, Spain controlled the region. Mary Queen of Scots, also known as Mary Stuart, was the Catholic Queen of Scotland from 1542 to 1567, and had her eyes on the English throne. She was ultimately beheaded in 1587. Her son James I succeeded Elizabeth. Through, I suppose, no fault of her own, Mary Queen of Scots was a figurehead of the Catholic cause. Those that thought Elizabeth was a bastard and illegitimate as a result of being the offspring of the second marriage of Henry and Anne Boleyn sought to get Mary Stuart on the throne. Deeply religious, having been brought up in Catholic France, Mary fled to England in 1568, having abdicated from the Scottish throne. She was kept under house arrest during her 19 years in England, but her presence rallied disgruntled Catholics, leading first to the Northern Rebellion in 1569, the Rodolphi Plot of 1571, the Throckmorton Plot of 1583, and the Babington Plot in 1586, which ultimately led to her execution for treason. Lord Darnley, cousin of Elizabeth I, was Mary Queen of Scots' second husband. This gave her another great claim to the English throne, in addition to being the granddaughter of Henry VIII's sister, Margaret. The marriage to Lord Darnley was brief and unhappy, but it did produce a son called James that would go on to succeed Elizabeth. David Rizzio was the private secretary of Mary, Queen of Scots. While she was still in Scotland, the trust that Mary placed in him, however, caused jealousy and hatred on part of many of the great Scottish nobles. They persuaded Lord Darnley, Mary's husband, that Rizzio was Mary's lover. Then, in 1566, with Darnley's support, they broke into Mary's quarters in Holyrood Palace. They seized Rizzio in the presence of the Queen and killed him, stabbing him over 50 times. Lord Darnley did not stab Rizzio, but the Lord's knife was left inside to show his compliance. There is no proof to say that Mary and Rizzio were having an affair, but it is clear that this murder was only part of a larger campaign by Scottish nobles against Mary, hoping that she would abdicate. Darnley's murder and Mary's third marriage to Earl of Bothwell triggered the chain of events that led to Mary's forced abdication in 1567. When Darnley was murdered, many people believed that Mary and her close friend the Earl of Bothwell were behind the murder. Their suspicions seemed to be confirmed when Mary married Bothwell a few months later. This marriage was unpopular with the Scottish nobles, who rebelled against Mary. They imprisoned her and forced her to abdicate or give up the throne in favour of her one-year-old son, James. In 1568, Mary escaped from prison and raised an army. Her forces, however, were defeated in battle and she fled south to England. Many of the northern nobles were still committed Catholics and wanted to see the restoration of Catholicism in England under a Catholic monarch. The arrival, therefore, of Mary Queen of Scots in 1568 gave them hope that Elizabeth could be replaced with Mary. Elizabeth had confiscated a large amount of land from the Earl of Northumberland and had shared this with Northumberland's main rivals in the North and Southern Protestants. Northumberland was also angry that Elizabeth had claimed all the profits from the copper mines on his estate. Northumberland was also unhappy about how Elizabeth had used the Council of the North to help her govern the area. The council was controlled mostly by Southern Protestants. Northern nobles such as Westmoreland and Northumberland deeply resented this, causing a rebellion that was eventually defeated by the Royal Army. Northumberland was beheaded in York in 1572. William Cecil, 
or later Lord Burley, was Elizabeth's Chief Secretary of State until 1571, when she named him Lord Burley, and replaced him with a more ruthless, albeit loyal, Francis Walsingham. Lord Burley, trained as a lawyer, and had served previously as Secretary of State to Edward VI. He was certainly very experienced. He was a brilliant and hard-working administrator who served Elizabeth, first as Secretary of State and, from 1572, as Lord Treasurer. As his responsibilities increased, he became ever more prudent and cautious, urging the Queen to maintain good relations with the Catholic powers France and Spain, and avoid expensive bloody wars. He gathered about him a circle of like-minded administrators such as Sir Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal, Sir Francis Colley, Vice Chamberlain of the Household, these cautious men stood in stark contrast to the other great circle of court and its leader, Robert Dudley. This is why it is often said that Elizabeth's court was split into two factions, one led by the Cecils and the other Dudley. The Duke of Norfolk played a central role in the Northern Rebellion in 1569. He was the most senior English noble, the wealthiest landowner in the country and the cousin of the Queen. He resented William Cecil's power as Elizabeth's chief minister and was frustrated that his talents were being underrated by Elizabeth and her regime. He was also a Catholic sympathiser who disproved of such unfriendly policies towards Spain. Norfolk had a plan to marry Mary and get her to replace Elizabeth as the Queen of England. He enlisted the help of two courtiers. One was Sir Nicholas Throckmorton and unfortunately the other was Elizabeth's favourite Robert Dudley. Despite wanting to see Cecil's power reduced, Dudley soon confessed all to the Queen and Cecil. Norfolk fled the court and was captured, imprisoned and begged for forgiveness. Despite being a central player in the Northern Rebellion, Elizabeth, out of family loyalty, decided to not have him executed as the Privy Council wished and instead imprisoned him in the Tower of London. He was released just nine months in August 1570. However, Norfolk continued to plot against Elizabeth and was beheaded in 1572 for his role in the Rodolphi plot. One of the conspirators of the Northern Rebellion was the Earl of Westmoreland. He was equally annoyed by the actions of Elizabeth and pushed him to rebel with the Earl of Northumberland. On the 9th of November, 1569, the two joined forces at Branseth Castle. Church bells rang out to call people to rebel. This rising involved nearly 5,000 rebels who moved through the north of England. They illegally held a mass in Durham Cathedral on the 14th of November. They then headed further south, and soon most of the land east of the Pennines was in rebel hands. The Earl of Sussex, the president of the Council of the North, struggled to raise an army on Elizabeth's behalf to deal with the rebellion. By December, the rebels were hoping for support from the Spanish. However, it never came. The Royal Army moved forward and the rebels running to retreat crossed the border into Scotland on the 19th of December. Westmoreland escaped abroad, unlike Northumberland who was executed. Pope from 1566 to 1572, Pius tirelessly and harshly persecuted and encouraged the persecution of Protestants throughout Europe. In 1570, Elizabeth was excommunicated or expelled from the Catholic Church by the Pope. This meant that Catholics no longer had to obey the Queen and were encouraged to overthrow her. Together with the Northern Rebellion, the excommunication changed Elizabeth's attitude towards Catholics. They were now seen as potential traitors and, with the arrival of Mary Queen of Scots, plots began to move against her. In response, to the excommunication, Parliament passed the Treason Act in 1571. Under this act, anyone who claimed that Elizabeth wasn't England's legitimate ruler could face the death penalty. Rodolphi had played a minor part in the revolt of the Northern Earls, but acted as a messenger between Mary Queen of Scots, to the Pope, Philip II of Spain, and forces commanded by the Duke of Alba based in the Netherlands. Rodolphi left England to meet the Duke of Alva in the Netherlands, who led the Spanish army there, carrying letters written in code. Rodolphi then travelled to meet with the Pope and Philip II. The letters argued for an invasion of England with the aim of overthrowing Elizabeth and replacing her with Mary, who would ultimately marry the Duke of Norfolk, leading to the restoration of Catholicism in England. The plot was foiled by Elizabeth's intelligence network ran by William Cecil. One of Rodolphi's messengers was intercepted and threw torture information about the plot. Whilst the Duke of Norfolk was executed, Elizabeth decided not to execute Mary Queen of Scots for her involvement in the plot due to lack of evidence. 
Rodolfi managed to avoid the fate of the Duke of Norfolk since he remained in Italy. In retaliation at the Spanish involvement, Elizabeth expelled the Spanish ambassador. The plot intensified the feeling amongst Elizabeth's court that Spain was becoming a growing threat. Elizabeth's chief secretary of state from 1573 to 1590 replaced Burley. Walsingham, a committed Protestant, knew the dangers of Catholicism, having witnessed the killing of 3,000 Protestants when he was England's ambassador to France at the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre on the streets of Paris, 1572. This left the lasting impression and drive to crush any Catholic threat against Elizabeth. Walsingham played a key role in the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and the previous plots to replace Elizabeth with Mary. Working alongside William Cecil, despite being an ally of Robert Dudley, the two of them formed a large spy network to keep Elizabeth safe. King James VI was the son of Mary Queen of Scots. In the end, with Elizabeth not having an heir to the throne, some could argue that this was Mary Queen of Scots' ultimate victory. Her son became the King of England. With Elizabeth not having any children, the Tudor dynasty came to an end. Francis Drake was John Hawkins' cousin, and had travelled with Hawkins on many slave trading expeditions. Drake explored the South American coastline, raiding many Spanish settlements as he went. In the Pacific, he captured two valuable Spanish treasure ships. In order to get the treasure ships safely back to England, Drake had to return by a different route, as the Spanish had sent ships to intercept him in the South American coastline region. So, on his way home, he had to go west and sail through the Indian Ocean back to England. When he returned, Drake was knighted by Elizabeth aboard his ship, the Golden Hind. This royal recognition and the vast wealth that Drake brought back from his journey encouraged more sailors to set out on long distance journeys. Drake was involved in many other important naval expeditions. In 1587, he led a raid on the Spanish port of Cadiz, known as the Singeing of the King's Beard, that helped delay the Spanish Armada for a time. And, in 1588, he played a key role in the defeat of the Spanish Armada. He died of disease in 1596 whilst trying to conquer Spanish colonies in the Americas. The Earl of Leicester that was the title given to Sir Robert Dudley by Elizabeth in 1564. He was a born courtier and soldier. He was dashing and handsome and served Elizabeth as her master of the horse, which gave him constant access to her person. You might be thinking, what kind of position is this, the person in charge of the stables? Well, it was traditionally given to her favourites. Lester was the Queen's close friend, and probably her lover. Where Cecil urged caution, Dudley wanted action. In particular, a Protestant crusade against Catholic powers, which he of course would lead as Elizabeth's general. His circle attracted soldiers, poets and other flamboyant characters such as Sir Christopher Hatton, the Lord Chancellor, and Sir Francis Walsingham, Secretary of State and Master of the Queen's Spies. Dudley was not sufficiently weighty to be the next co-ruler of England. In particular, he was opposed by the Cecil faction. Dudley had already married Amy Nee Robsart, Lady Dudley. When Lady Dudley turned up dead at the bottom of a stairwell, many suspected that her ambitious husband had had her killed. In fact, Lady Dudley was suffering from breast cancer. She may have simply fallen down the stairs due to weakness, or she may have thrown herself down the stairs in dejection. In any case, the scandal brought Elizabeth to her senses. In 1566, she finally repudiated any notion of marrying him. When he died in 1588, Elizabeth shut herself in her room until Lord Burdley had to bash open the door. The Duke was one of Philip II's most able military commanders. He became commander of the Spanish army in the Netherlands in 1578 at age just 32. He helped recapture territory captured by Dutch rebels, the most notable being the port of Antwerp in 1585. The Spanish Armada of 1588 was meant to transport his army across the Channel to invade England. However, due to rebels and poor communication, this was prevented. Philip had appointed the Duke of Medina to lead the Armada. A senior Spanish nobleman, he was chosen more because of his rank than his ability. He was actually a very poor choice, as he had no experience of being at sea. In contrast, the English fleet was expertly led by the Queen's cousin Lord Howard, showing little initiative, and his incompetence was a significant factor in the Spanish Armada's failure. He was one of the few to survive the Armada and make it back to Spain. Sir Walter Raleigh 
This English writer and adventurer delighted Elizabeth, but was put to death by her successor, James I. Walter Raleigh was a member of the Gentry family in Devon, and his family were involved in international exploration. Raleigh first visited America in 1578. From the early 1580s, Raleigh had a powerful position at court as one of Elizabeth's favourites. In 1584, Elizabeth gave Raleigh permission to explore and colonise unclaimed territories in the Americas. She wanted him to establish a colony on the Atlantic coast of North America, and tried he did in 1585. He called the colony Virginia, after Elizabeth, who was known as the Virgin Queen. However, the settlers soon ran low on supplies, and when Sir Francis Drake visited, most of them abandoned the colony and returned to England. Anthony Babington, or the Babington Plot of 1586, was the third key plot against the life of Elizabeth. The Babington Plot ultimately resulted in not just the execution of Anthony Babington and his conspirators, but also Mary Queen of Scots. The plot basically had the same aims of the Rodolphian Throckmorton plot, to replace Elizabeth with Mary Queen of Scots through the use of an invading army. In this case, the plan was to use the invading army of France, financed by Philip II of Spain. Babington wrote a letter to Mary, outlining his friendship and support of her. There is a specific video on my channel dealing with this plot in much more detail, but all you need to know, his letters were intercepted along with Mary by Walsingham, and consequently Babington and his conspirators were arrested, convicted of treason, and executed. The Throckmorton plot involved a plan to encourage a popular uprising amongst English Catholic nobles in the north of England. Like the Rodolphi plot of 1571, this too was thwarted. Francis Throckmorton was a young English Catholic who had acted as a go-between or messenger between Mary Queen of Scots and the Catholic noble plotters and the Spanish ambassador and the French ambassador. Throckmorton liaised between these groups with the aim of the plot to overthrow Elizabeth and get Mary Queen of Scots on the throne. Throckmorton eventually was convicted of high treason and beheaded in 1584. The Throckmorton plot was one of the reasons the symbolic bond of association was devised in 1584 to protect Elizabeth's life against all threats from enemies within the realm. The bond of association aimed at deterring other future plots. All nobles had to sign the bond of association, which determined that anyone plotting against Elizabeth in the future would be executed. John Hawkins was the main culprit in the conflict over the West Indies in the New World between Spain and England. From 1562 to 68, Hawkins led three expeditions to West Africa to purchase slaves for the sale in Spain's New World territories. Hawkins' final voyage ended in a major Anglo-Spanish clash at San Juan Yolo in 1568 Mexico. Most of the English fleet was captured or sunk and many English sailors were captured. Sir Francis Drake, Hawking's cousin, would certainly not forget this. It is one of the key motivating factors in Drake's hatred towards both Catholicism and the Spanish. Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, was one of Leicester's stepsons and became Elizabeth's favoured companion or favourite towards the end of her life until a botched military intervention in Ireland destroyed his reputation. Essex was put to death in 1601 after leading an attempted rebellion. Essex was the stepson of Elizabeth's earlier favourite, Robert Dudley. He came to the court in 1584 and quickly became a favourite himself. He was extremely ambitious for military success and could be arrogant and disrespectful even towards the Queen. In 1593, he was made the Earl of Essex and a member of the Privy Council. Essex's rise led to a growth in two conflicting groups, just like the one before, with the Earl of Essex on one side and the Cecils on the other. Essex had been sent to Ireland in 1599 to crush the Tyrone Rebellion. Essex had made some attempt to fight the rebels, were unsuccessful. He made a truce with them and abandoned his post returning to England without the Queen's permission. As a punishment, Elizabeth put Essex under house arrest for a time and banished him from the court and took away most of his public offices. He was probably most annoyed in November 1600 when Elizabeth took away the main source of his income, a monopoly on the distribution of sweet wines. A loss of political power drove Essex to rebellion the following year. Essex aimed to seize the Queen and force her to replace close advisers, particularly Cecil, with him and his followers. This however failed in just a few hours, receiving no support from Londoners. 
Essex was arrested and tried for treason and being executed in February 1601. The lack of popular support for Essex's rebellion shows that it wasn't a serious threat to Elizabeth's rule and that she was still a popular and respected queen. However, the rebellion does suggest that Elizabeth's authority over the court became weaker towards the end of her reign and by 1590 she was no longer using patronage effectively as she once had in the past. Thanks for making it to the end. I've put some practice questions up should you wish to give these a go. Leave any questions you have in the comments if you are unsure of any specific individual and you would like a few questions answered. Don't forget to get your daily dose of lessons in history on Instagram and follow along. These videos are here for your benefit, so if you like the video, you know what to do. And if you didn't, then please tell me how I can make them better. Who do you think was the most important individual in Elizabethan England? I'd be curious to hear what you have to say in the comments. Thanks for watching Lessons in History, and I'll see you in the next video.